creativity for me isn't just about writing or drawing or painting or singing or composing. It's the way you see your life. Radical center is, you know, that's where I want to be. I don't really care where the ideas come from, left or right, or as long as they're not noxious, as long as they propel people in the direction of fair and inclusive prosperity, I'm with that. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with Bono. Bono is an artist, activist, and lead singer of the band U2. U2 has won numerous awards, including 22 Grammys, more than any other duo or group. In 2005, U2 was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and this past December, they were awarded the Kennedy Center Honors. Alongside his role in U2, Bono is a groundbreaking activist. He is a co-founder of One and Red organizations dedicated to fight against extreme poverty and preventable disease. One lobbies governments to fund programs like the U.S. PEPFAR AIDS program, which has saved 25 million lives. Red recruits companies to join the fight against AIDS and has raised $700 million to date to fight AIDS in Africa. In 2016, Bono co-founded the TPG Rise Fund, a global impact fund investing in entrepreneurial companies, driving positive social and environmental change in alignment with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. He's the author of a terrific new book called Surrender, 40 Songs, One Story, which was published this past November. Bono, welcome to the podcast. Most people know you as one of rock and roll's all-time greats or as a groundbreaking activist. But what stands out to me is that you are a creative problem solver and change agent. Someone who really digs down, understands, and advocates for action that will make a difference. I've appreciated the opportunity to work and collaborate with you on climate change at the TPG Rise Climate Fund. Your new book, Surrender, is terrific. I highly recommend it, particularly the audio version. And your Surrender Tour is like no other book event I have ever seen. Two hours of nonstop energy and creativity, mixing storytelling, song, and art, and a one-man tour de force. For those of you who haven't seen it, Surrender will be running at the Beacon Theater in New York City in April and May. But this podcast is not just about the book. It's about Bono, the global statesman. So let's get started. Bono, you're very much a citizen of the world, but your hometown of Dublin is a big part of who you are. Talk about your upbringing in Dublin. How did it shape you, and how does it keep you centered today? Well, thank you, Hank. Thanks for inviting me onto your podcast. I just love to be in a conversation with you. Any excuse. And I tend not to tell my rock and roll friends that I have a, a, an interest in economics and in people who have made some sense out of the insane world of finance, but uh, you're just a, a hero to me. Um, so this is a great treat. And, and uh, I wish I were asking you these questions, um, but I will try to answer yours. And as regards Dublin and Ireland, I can't imagine you two could have come out of anywhere else. Uh, although in the 60s when I was born uh, and in the 70s when you two was born, it looked odd and a bit of a social experiment that you'd have, you know, an Englishman, a Welshman, an Irish Protestant. <laughs> half Protestant, half Catholic, one Catholic. I mean, it's, it's like a joke, you know, um, an Englishman, a Welshman and two Irishmen went into a bar kind of a joke, but, but you two came out of a very particular time and place. Mount Temple comprehensive school was a free school, non fee paying school. It was multi-denominational. It was non-denominational rather, and, uh, co-educational. Um, I, 
I, I liked all of the above, but particularly that there were girls there and we all wore our own clothes, and which was nice. There was no uniform in, that we wore and there was no uniform thinking. And I would say Mount Temple Comprehensive is what got me uh, into a place where I, you know, was encouraged to think um, differently and freely. And and so I credit Ireland as gifting me with that great education. And here I am. So when did you first realize you wanted to be a musician? I had all kinds of uh, mixed up ambitions. You know, I love to play chess. I I wasn't that good at sports, but I still, you know, would occasionally be out on the rugby field. I liked English. I liked writing. But I realized from a very early age that I woke up with melodies in my head and that that wasn't normal for other people. In fact, my earliest memory of music is being in a church hall where my head wasn't even, I couldn't even see the keys. So I don't know what age that makes me, but I could just about see the keys. And I remember, you know, putting my foot on the pedal that turned the single note into turning the, the little church hall into a cathedral. That was a, that was a real moment. And finding a rhyme for that note as I, you know, finding other notes that sounded good together. So I was very young when, when I came across music. And then that was the sort of, I suppose, just an innate passion, I suppose is the right word for it. But it, it wasn't just that I loved music. I got the rather immodest idea into my head that music loved me back. That's a wonderful, wonderful gift. It took some of us a lot longer to figure out what we wanted to do. And boy, did you take it and run with it. So now, Bono, I like to talk about you as a people person. You can connect with people from different cultures and walks of life, from your grade school buddies, concert fans, and heads of state, to those fighting extreme poverty. I've seen you use these skills to read people, to motivate and persuade. How much of this has come naturally and how much of it is learned behavior born out of experience and necessity as you work to get things done? That's a good question. Yeah, I think about it um, a lot. And I think, I think it goes back to Mount Temple Comprehensive again. Just the, there were so many kind of different kinds of people and I, I had to think on my feet. And then I suppose I've always believed you're as good as the arguments you get. And so I would surround myself. I've always surrounded myself with people who I considered smarter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, certainly Ali, um, but also just my mates as I grew up. I just, I wanted to be around clever people. They didn't need to be clever academically. They just needed to be clever. They need to be original thinkers. And they needed to be able to argue with me. I'm comfortable around argument. One of the problems I have when I'm when you become a big star is people think you don't want to hear, um, you know, something unpleasant, you know, and they tell you everything that you're doing is of interest, even if it isn't. And they don't understand that I'm allergic to that. And I got that from Dublin. You know, in Dublin, people are, are very suspicious of success because of the age old relationship with the colonial power with, you know, Great Britain next door. We always associated success with collaboration with the enemy. So Irish people are very suspicious, or up until recently, of success. And as you went away to America or Australia or indeed England, but in our own country, we're a little bit wary of success. And I think we're right. I think success is a good thing, but perhaps you admire it too much in the United States, if you don't mind what I'm saying. And I think a sense of humor is important. I think storytelling is important. I think Irish people have those kind of values. I mean, you share in the U.S., I think family, you know, respect for family, that's important in the U.S., is important in Ireland. Um, but, but to get back to answering your question, I, I think it's, I'm, I've surround myself with very different kinds of personalities. And I like the noise. I like the din. I like the friction of argument. I'm comfortable around argument. I'm uncomfortable when things get too straight and too predictable. And that has helped me when I've gone into the room as an activist dealing with um, 
you know, whether it's politicians or policymakers who are not that pleased to see me. You know, it's, to me, that's very wise. You know, um, to solve big problems, it, it takes thinking big. But more than that, you have to overcome all kinds of resistance, right? You know, there's inertia, there's a sense of hopelessness, you need to listen. So unless you can read people, motivate people, inspire people to action, you don't succeed, right? One of my detractors back in the days when I was at Goldman Sachs said, Hank, is it that smart? He just listens to whole kinds of bright people, synthesizes their ideas, and makes them his own. And I, I took that as a compliment, right? Just substitute ideas and songs, and you just described me. That's who I am. And um, so I, I like that. That, 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 might, that might be the basis of our friendship, Hank. <laughs> but, I, but it's just, you know, you want to be you're as good as the arguments you get as we've been saying, and in you too, i got some great arguments. In the world of politics, I, I had a great help in this regard with Bobby Shriver. And I remember going to a Capitol Hill, advancing the idea of debt cancellation for the poorest countries on the planet on the turn of the millennium. And when I was organizing meetings, Bobby used to always say to me, we need to get people that you wouldn't normally have meetings with you. We need to get Republicans. We've come from the left, clearly. I come from the left as a Kennedy, Shriver. But we need, we need people on the right to work with. And I remember he introduced me to John Kasich. Arnold Schwarzenegger actually made the first introduction to us with, with, with John Kasich who, you know, b became very important in, in arguing for debt cancellation. And people would be very confused if they dropped by the bar on a Friday night and I'd be in the Jefferson Hotel or whatever, and they'd say, who is he hanging out with? Like, these people do not, these people would not be in the room together normally. And, you know, occasionally we would have, you know, big showdowns. I remember uh, Larry Summers and John Kasich going at it one night. And, and I thought, wow, this is how I'd always hoped politics would be, you know, is like a kitchen table back in Dublin in Ireland with people vociferously arguing their points of view. And I, I just felt totally at home in your capital with all these people who couldn't agree on much. But the one thing I got them you know, to agree on, or we got them to agree on, and the one campaign was not to play politics with the lives of the poorest of the poor. Yep. And bringing people together, finding middle ground is the key. Bono, now let's talk about creativity. Describe the Bono creative processes and how they have evolved over time. How much is inspiration? How much is perspiration, hard work, and discipline? to push your talents to the next level or into new areas? Devolution <laughs> uh, rather than evolution. I'm still a child in the playpen, really. And in, in all areas of, of endeavor, you know, not just music. Creativity for me isn't just about writing or drawing or painting or singing or composing. It's the way you see your life. And I like a bit of chaos. So, you know, the child who's got the paints out and the, the paints are all over their face, <laughs> all over the floor. You running in with the, with the water saying, yo, God, you just spilt all of that. That's me. And I never grew out of it. I mean, turning your rage into beauty, your, your in sense of injustice, you know, your annoyance at the world and its unfairness. You try to turn it into something Beautiful, turning rage into beauty. That's my job as an artist. But it's, it stays childlike. And I remember when I was a kid, somebody asked, I was, in, I was a teacher in school. This is before Man Temple Comprehensive. And I was in charge of the library, I think, for a bit. And one of the teachers said, was talking about William Butler Yeats, the great Irish poet, and saying, well, this was the period when he had a kind of creative block and I put my hand out up as a kid and I said, um, why didn't he write about that? And the teacher looked at me like, don't be so annoying. But I really thought that. And in my own life, that's what I do. If I have an empty page in front of me, 
and I feel like I have nothing to say, the opening line of the song will be, and probably has been, I have nothing to say. And that's the truth unlocks the moment. And I got that when I was a kid, when I was a child. And yeah, as a writer, you have to be truthful. The truth unlocks a lot of things. And it does in relationships too, you know, when you have that moment with somebody in, you know, in a plane or in a bar or, you know, whatever it is, you know, meet somebody wherever. And it's that moment when they're honest with you that, you know, ah, we've connected with something. That's what creativity is when you when you get there. And even people who are not writers, like say, you know, Frank Sinatra wasn't a writer, but he chose material that revealed who he was. And it's in those moments of candor that his greatness exists. Uh, in my book, In Surrender, I give an example of Sinatra where I talk about how I have two versions of My Way, his famous torch song. And it's the same lyric, same melody, same arrangement, same key. And yet in one, in his 50s, he sings it as a, as a boast, I did it my way. And then the other in his 70s, he sings it, and it's an apology. And I cannot believe he did that. But it's just this, the gift of interpretive singing, him being true to himself, him being honest about where he was in his life. And you feel it in the work. So being a child, chaos, not being afraid of chaos. And then I suppose a, a truthfulness, a child will just does what it wants. I'm a bit like that. So rock and roll is one big tantrum, Hank. And I tell you, Bono, in all walks of life, authenticity makes a difference. If someone is being authentic, you can tell it and... People will work with you. People will follow you. If Even if you make mistakes or whatever, they'll respect you if you're authentic. Bono, you're a global statesman using your celebrity and charisma, but also some remarkable policy expertise to advocate for humanitarian and social causes. How and when did you become interested in, in these issues? It's true. Irish people, we burn with a sense of justice for all, you know, it's, it's in us. And I think because we came from a very unjust situation for hundreds of years of oppression, that's an easy thing to say. We learned a lot from, from, from our oppressors too, but one of the ways through it actually was authenticity, which you just said, and the least attractive Irish quality is we can flatter people too well. And you got to be careful with that because our stronger characteristic is toward fairness. And we want it not just for ourselves, but for others. And it started with the civil rights movement, of course, with our own independence and the civil rights movement in the North of Ireland, a movement led by a character later won the Nobel Prize, John Hume, a figure cut in the clothes of, of sort of your Martin Luther King, a nonviolent, uh, poetic leadership. But, but outside of our own situation, you'd be surprised at how many Irish people are interested and even involved to some degree in injustices as they present themselves in foreign territories a long way from ours, particularly the injustice of poverty, of extreme poverty in Africa. I mean, wherever I went in Africa, to be a, a nun or a priest jumping out from behind a bush, some Irish nun or priest, I mean, we're everywhere. And then back in Ireland, radio played a real educational role. And at times before all women got a chance to go to, to work, women were very informed. And so my family and my mother's friends, even when my mother wasn't around, I, you know, we would listen to Gay Byrne. It was the name of the radio host. We listened to lots of them. Um, Marion Fanuc. I'm thinking of all of them as I grew up. And they're just, these are, these are people who not knew what they were talking about on talk radio, not the kind of bellicose firebrands that we have now. Um, on the on the right or indeed on the left. These are people who just 
had a humanity and a, and, and knew that to quote um, Nelson Mandela, poverty was not natural; it was man-made and could be overcome by the actions of men and women. We sort of knew that in Ireland. So I think that, I think that was really deep within me. And in fact, you two played our first ever anti-apartheid show before we had a record deal in our teens. Pretty amazing. So Bono, back to creativity. Can you explain how your artistic creativity has translated into problem-solving creativity, and how have you used it to improve people's lives and advocate for policy change? I understood with you two that I worked well in bands, that I liked sort of horizontal relationships, and that I didn't trust verticals so well. I didn't, in that sense, want to have a boss or really be a boss. I really, I liked being in the room where I looked across to people. And that, that's true uh, of Ali. Ali was the one who said to me, actually, she said, don't look up to me or down at me. Look across to me. That's where I am. And, and I've been like that with you too. But then I started to form other bands like The One Campaign or Red um, and even Rise, where I, I just, I like to be in that, in and around the creativity of conversations that wish to go places and wish to challenge ourselves by those conversations. I love that. And I think that's that's the creative life. I don't know if you've read this book by Ian McGilchrist called, I think it's called The Master and the Emissary. It's about how the, the brain works, left and right brain. And the right brain is where really the, the, the sort of creativity lives. And the left brain is, is very important. It's the sort of bureaucracy of the right and, and its efficiency and it, it, it files things and it processes things. And it's very easy to move from the creative, the right side of the brain, and stay in the left. And I've noticed a lot of people who are very creative as I grew up suddenly leaving the right and, and just making lists <laughs> <laughs> getting very organized but what they're organized what they're organizing isn't that interesting and i in my activism i i'm i'm attracted to people who stay in the right brain as much as they can there's no lack of big ideas out there so what it really takes is what i've seen you do right is to take a big idea work to adapt it and make it actionable and then it, it it's not going to make a difference unless you can get something done right so then motivating inspiring bringing people together you know the the enemies are hopelessness inertia right and so to me i've seen you take that creative process listen to people and then laser focus on getting things done so you may not make lists right, but boy, when you're focused, you're a heat-seeking missile. I'm relentless, that's for sure. And I do make lists, and and I do, I, I am organized. I have, I am because I surround myself with very organized people, and I might be a bit churlish here uh, by underselling the left side of my brain because I think what's unusual for the way people view artists is. If, if you have left and right brain talking, you're a little bit of an anomaly. But I have left and right brain talking. And you're an anomaly and boy, a, a force of nature. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's, it's, it's probably uncomfortable to be around. But, but I'm, one of the things I'm learning about myself, which is not very highfalutin at all, which is, and this is an ego thing. And ego is not helpful generally. I mean, you cannot. Um, to cry it, you know, Delmore Schwartz, that writer, he's, he wrote a book called The Ego is Always at the Wheel, and it is. But it can also be the thing that sort of drains your batteries and and kind of wears the car out before you take the ride. So I think that over the while I've been able to fail 
um, or it's quote Samuel Beckett, fail more, fail better. I've no fear of failure in that sense. But the ego is uh, there and very present in that I don't like to fail. So I know I, if I'm going to fail or we're going to fail, it's much more interesting than I'm going to fail. I expose myself. So I've realized I, I play a kind of psychological trick where I might say, yeah, we're going to do this. This, this. this is what we're going to do. And then I'll tell everyone we're going to do it. And then I have to do it. And that's really annoying um, for people around me. And it's annoying for me because then I have to really know the subject. You know, you need to get to know your opponent. And I think as a strategic thinker, I'm very good at getting to know the opponent. I want to know who's in the way of this. And I need to know everything about them. And this probably goes back to playing chess and reading other people's games. But I think it also just it, it comes to growing up in Dublin and knowing who to talk to if you didn't want to get your if you didn't want to get your head kicked in. And um, there's a little bit of that. And, but I, so it's not all, it's not all kind of dedication is what I'm saying to you. Part of it is an ego. I'm accepting that that is necessary to power uh, things on, but it's also your undoing. So now let's talk about one area where you certainly didn't fail, which is Africa. Much of your work has been focused on saving and improving lives, often working in partnership with activists in Africa. What drew you to that continent, and what is your organization, one, focused on doing there? I don't think it's just Africa, the magnificent place, or this extraordinary continent of so many diverse countries, 54 countries. That's where I really, I was most inspired at the possibility of human potential. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Even in Ethiopia, where I started out and after the famine in 1985, Ali and I went and worked there as part of World Vision. We went there, we worked on a camp. We ran a kind of orphanage where I was known as the girl with the beard because <laughs> um, uh, I had an earring and a few other names, but Ethiopia was it was a magnificent country. But over the years, I I got to know Ethiopians, some of the most inspiring people I ever met. Indeed, the leader of Ethiopia, Malay Sanawi, who I got to know briefly, he talked about stuff that would be. You'd be interested in Hank. He used to speak about entrepreneurs. He said, oh, he say, Ethiopian entrepreneurs, they're the best in the world. And I'd say, why do you think that? He'd say, I'm speaking of farmers are the best entrepreneurs in the world. Oh, Ethiopian farmers are the best Ethiopian. Okay, I get it. And, and why are they, Mr. President? And he'd say, because they'd be dead if they weren't. <laughs> and he'd laugh. And, but it wasn't funny. And and he was just saying, literally, their lives depended on it. And where you, what you see in countries that are fragile, fragile states for whatever reasons, is you see a people who just, you know, are just become so innovative. If they're given half the chance, they'll outsmart, outmaneuver, outfigure any problem in their way. I mean, by 2050, the continent of Africa, it will have one quarter of the, the world's youth, the entire planet's youth, if you think about that. And, and you just have all this industry and innovation. And we need to recognize the potential of these people. And I suppose to try and answer your question, before I fully grasped that, I saw it in very close and personal way. I saw the crisis of HIV AIDS and how it was destroying communities and nurses and farmers and workers and just kids. There were certain countries in 
and places and cities in Africa, particularly in the south, um, I remember southeast, where a third of the adult population were going to die. If 50% of all truckers in Africa were going to die. And I remember thinking, wow, all the potential of this, all these people were losing all this potential. And I suppose deep in the heart of my faith, I sort of see love or my definition of love is the realizing of another's potential, realizing of your own potential and the potential of others. That's what love is. And I saw that, gosh, we've invented our science and our medicine has brought us these antiretroviral drugs. They were very expensive originally to produce, as Tony Fauci would tell you. But my goodness, with the work of Bill Clinton and others, the prices were coming down. Uh, they were changing regulations so that countries who were really brutalized by this pandemic could actually uh, figure their own response. So the generic antiretrovirals came on the market and were accessible. And then we managed to meet those, and there were many, many AIDS activists in the world at that time. But we managed to meet a President Bush who got this. He got the strategic importance of, of the continent of Africa. And he got this idea of the squandering of human potential. And along with Condoleezza Rice, Josh Bolton, Tony Fauci, Gary Edson, a bunch of people in that White House, there began the largest health intervention in the history of medicine to fight a single disease up until this pandemic, the coronavirus. This is something Americans really need to be so proud of. And it's across the board because John Kerry started this, you know, Barbara Lee started this, Obama continued this. It's something that all Americans should feel proud of. I, I love telling Americans, I said, if you're an American, you're an AIDS activist. Some of them don't want to hear that, by the way. <laughs> like, what do you mean? I don't want to be, I'm not an AIDS. I said, well, you are. And I think that's something that I'm really excited about. We're in the 20th anniversary of, of PEPFAR which is what um, President Bush's emergency AIDS uh, package for relief for fight AIDS is called. It's, it's huge. It saved 25 million lives. It's just extraordinary. And it's the America that I love, it, that leads the world. And the Europeans followed through, the French and the Italians and the Canadians. They all came through. Um, the Irish are there now. You know, it's not over but it just shows you what's possible if you can get people who normally don't agree with each other to work on something together. And that is surely an inspiring thing for this United States, this present United States. I hope so anyway. Anu, now let's talk about globalization. To many people, this is a dirty word ranking right down there with capitalism particularly for many in the arts. So no doubt you've disappointed some of your admirers and fans when you've defended globalization and its benefits. How has your experience and work around the world influenced your view on globalization? And importantly, how do you think globalization and market-driven economic policies need to change to meet the challenges we face in today's world? The first person I want to credit in this regard is Paul McGuinness, who's the manager of U2 from when we formed U2. And Paul's great gift to our band and to me in particular was he refused to play the role of the money guy, you know, and you're the artists and you be all pure and I'll deal with the filthy lucre. He wouldn't play that game. And he was saying, that, you know, the people in business could be inspiring and creative. And a lot of artists could be a total pain in the arse. And the, you know, selfish narcissists. In fact, I'm one of them. <laughs> so I knew what he's talking about. But so I, I suppose early on, we learned not to run with that cliche of the artist as pure and holy and the business as being impure and unholy. 
And with you two, we were a sort of a band. As four people, you two were a band. But if you add our fifth, a manager, Paul McGuinness, we became a corporation. And that's a funny thing to say, but I think it's true. And, you know, Paul would say, any artist uh, who matters cares about where their art is hung. You know, the walls of the gallery, if they're a painter. What, what gallery? Who is the gallerist? These are questions you need to know the answers to. If you really care about painting and you care about your work and you put all this time into it. So that was a very good argument to hear as a young people. And even though we didn't really care that much about the cash, we cared that we were getting paid. Uh, indeed, we shared the cash between us. We, we, we shared everything. The bands, our songs, our songwriting, where you two publishes our songs with all four members of the band, whoever writes the song. So there was kind of egalitarian roots, but there was some tough-minded thinking went into you two. And I think then we had to take on the music industry, which it was, it had a lot of cliches too about, about owning up to your ambition. And I said, well, I want to be in the Beatles. They were ambitious. And I said, no, 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 you can't have ambition. Ambition is very uncool, Bono. You've got to stare at your shoes and do not look like, for example, you want to go to America because that will be very ambitious and very uncool. And we're like, but we really want to go to America. And for all the right reasons and probably a couple of the wrong ones, we just want to go. And, and that was, there was sort of against the rules of the particular music scene we were in. And, and I, I remember thinking at the time, oh, kind of nonsense though, isn't it? And the same was applied to politics. And then I suppose when get, coming to globalization, that was the lesson. As an activist, I'd be meeting finance ministers and people who really cared about the progress of their peoples away from poverty. And they'd be saying, I wouldn't mind a bit of that globalization, actually. <laughs> we wouldn't mind it in our country. And, and I'm saying, but what does that mean? Well, it meant commerce. And I suppose we use the word sustainable now or shared or inclusive growth. That's unarguable. If you were a, a nascent country coming into your sense of self and commerce is essential. And a lot of activists like me, we want to believe it's all about development. But it's not. And it's kind of humbling when you realize that the thing that takes people out of extreme poverty more than anything is commerce. And yes, you hope it's sustainable. Yes, you hope it's inclusive. But there it is. And I, I, started, to, I started to want to understand better economics. I started to want to understand how the world of commerce worked. I didn't know much about it. In order to learn things, I generally do things. So I learned about investing. I learned about tech. You know, t technology was transforming the world of music. And I needed to understand it. So I started to meet with tech people. And a lot of them were familiar to me. They were kind of like the people I'd be in bands with. And very right-brained, certainly the founders. So I started to learn about commerce that way probably through Silicon Valley and those campuses around Stanford and MIT. I'm fascinated by those people too. I mean, I just, um, it's America, isn't it? You're, you're really, you know, when America works the best, it has public and private capital, both working together. And, you know, I was talking to somebody just today actually about Sputnik. And was it 1957 or something when the Russians had the first sort of uh, satellite orbiting the, the Earth? And the Americans went, we're not falling behind in this. This is a danger to our, our national security apart from anything else. And so, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars were invested in 
science and in education and in those campuses, these universities, but they gave us the internet and then the entrepreneurial spirit, I guess it's entrepreneurial capitalism, took it to the next level. I, I just think America at its best has both of those things. And I was humbled really that I knew so very little about all of this stuff, but I've, I've caught up. You and I are in real strong agreement there because what we've seen is that market forces in globalization, when tempered by good policy and regulation, have just created opportunity and proved the lives of millions and hundreds of millions of people around the world. No system is perfect, but people haven't invented a better system yet. And so what we need to do is just keep adapting to meet the challenges we have today. To my mates, I, I say, look, capitalism is not immoral. It's amoral. It, it, it's, a, it's a wild beast. It must receive our instruction. It's a great servant and a poor master, but it is an engine of growth that we have that works. You know, I haven't mentioned, but uh, I know you know uh, Muhammad Ibrahim. And Mo, as he's known as, is I think one of the most extraordinary moral voices on the continent of Africa. And it was him that made the throwdown to me. And not just to me, there was a bunch of, of kind of eggheads um, and tech people who were hanging out with him. I can't remember, I think it was maybe Senegal. And, and he was challenging everyone saying, if you really wanna see opportunity, you come and invest on our continent. This you'll see great growth. And, and he was right, just like I, explained about myself earlier. Africa wants horizontal relationships, not verticals, not the donor recipient relationship. So trade gives you that eye to eye relationship. And so, you know, Mohammed Ibrahim's foundation are all about governance. He gives a prize to um, elected officials who, who leave their office with a clean bill of financial health and have been exemplary. And that Ibrahim Prize is very important on the continent of Africa. He's, he came from Telcom. He was a brilliant engineer, I think, and then became this entrepreneur in, uh, in the Telcom space. But he's a kind of modern hero of Africa. It's interesting that it's, it's, a, it's, it's a business guy. And, and he's the one who challenged me to invest in Africa which in a strange way is how you and I end up in Rise because you are interested, even though you'd retired from Goldman Sachs and you had your foundations and your important work on conservation, but you, you were motivated to get back into commerce because you thought the engine of commerce would offer the innovation necessary to deal with the climate crisis. Is that right, Hank? That's very fair. And let's... But let's talk about TPG Rice uh, Climate Fund and the climate crisis, because as you said, you spent a lot of time around innovation and technology, and technologies and new technologies are going to be very important to meet this huge challenge and to work to decarbonize a global economy, 80% reliant on carbon-based fuels, but it's going to take a lot of capital. And that capital is not going to come unless it can come at a profit. And so how do you design a fund that measures social impact by carbon emissions avoided and gets the necessary return to bring all the capital that's going to need to come from the private sector because governments don't have it? You help make the case to me that I should return to my roots in finance. And I'm, I'm very grateful for it because it's, it's been energizing and it's been fun to work with you on that. You got involved earlier on with the rise, with the social impact, which was broader than climate, which again said, listen, it's great to do good, but if you have social impact, it better not be BS. You better measure it and be able to quantify it and then you got to make money because if you can't make money investing, it doesn't work. Yeah, that's the word sustainable again. An endeavor to be sustainable if it's out in the world is a lot easier to propel if it's profitable. And that goes back to being in U2 and being in a band. You know, the record company 
you know, we were with Island Records. They never told us how to do anything. You know, they offered us independence. Chris Blackwell offered us independence. What a great gift. And as long as I suppose we were succeeding, nobody would ever bother us. And so sustainability is a product of success. And the sort of ideas that will transform the the planet and cool the planet will certainly be turbocharged by kind of private enterprise backed by public policy, as well as public enterprise backed by public policy. I think we need both. Um, research and development is, is, is incredible. And, you know, another reason I'm interested in politics is I can see how bad politics leads very quickly to bad economics and how bad economics leads very quickly to very unhappy lives as people can't find work, as people in the developing world can't get access to water or life-saving medicines. So politics matters and economics matter and they matter to me. And, you know, I'm annoying again for, as an, as an artist, cause I'm, I'm sort of the radical center is, you know, that's where I want to be. I don't really care where the ideas come from left or right, or as long as they're not noxious, as long as they propel people in the direction of fair and inclusive prosperity. I'm with that when, you know, Ireland, my goodness, our story, it's incredible. And we've had great leadership that's brought us out of poverty over the last 30 years, 40 years. And we don't want to go back and we know the meaning of it. Innovative and ingenuity. These are words we, we, we required as a tiny little island in the North Sea, um, buffeted by bad weather and sometimes difficult neighbors. <laughs> um, but it, this stuff matters. And the reason why I was interested in you is I saw that that you had this kind of ability to kind of blow through the cliches and you know just get to the get to the the heart of the matter and that in the financial crisis in 2008 when the world was going down the tubes you would you'd talk to anybody so your ability to move through different rooms in your mind and in in and in politics in different ministries, you know, uh, finance ministries, but, you know, foreign ministries, you're interested in China, you're interested in, in the wider world and your ability to shape shift and move through these walls fascinated me. And I knew the way you lived, you know, and I liked the way you and Wendy went about your business because in your life, you're not the obvious business guy at all. And the reason I wanted to do the podcast is because our politics is hostage to our storytelling. So we need to get better at our storytelling because if to drown out, uh, there's a lot of noise and a compelling narrative is the narrative that takes people out of extreme poverty and in the direction of prosperity and gives people jobs and hopefully they're they're fairly paid jobs and people, there are CEOs that want to look after their employees and their staff. But yeah, I'm, I'm in awe of that. And yes, I'm an artist. And, but so was Yates, you know, Yates wrote about the radical center, that incredible line. When things fall apart in the center cannot hold, he says, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. You know, I'm a writer, I'm a musician. But I, I know that doctors are, do a more important job than I do, or nurses, teachers, and people who, who create um, employment on a, a large scale. So I am your fan, and, and I think the world owes you a debt of gratitude, and I'm grateful that you exist. Bono, you're an optimist. And for me, one of the most moving parts of your Surrender book tour is your tribute to America, its past and its future. All of us here in America today could use a little bit of that optimism. Why are you optimistic about America? I'm fascinated by America, but there's two Americas I'm fascinated with. The actual landmass, you know, the geography of America. There's not one piece of America 
I haven't wanted to go. And there's nowhere in America I've wanted to fly over, to use that awful expression, flyover country. There's no flyover country in the United States of America. Not for me, not for my band. We were in our blue bus and uh, wherever later on planes and trains, but we just came, we just, we, we just spent a lot of time in America and that's where we fell in love with America, American writers, Steinbeck, you know, then Springsteen, I thought was like a musical Steinbeck, you know, Sam Shepard, the city lights bookshop in San Francisco. I just, my, my mind is still inspired by America. And I know that you've got your dark undertow that you have to deal with and uh, that there is things that we just do not understand being European. Somebody said the other day, the Americans have the same problem with guns that, that Ireland has with alcohol, meaning what problem? You know, there's things that, you know, you've got to get to grips with, but I, I do love America and, I, and it's that spirit of innovation. And America loves you. Bono, you're a man of faith. What role does prayer play in your personal and your professional life? Well, before I came onto this podcast, I prayed uh, that I wouldn't screw up <laughs> because some days I wake up and I just, you know, I just can't string a sentence together. Prayer is an important part of not just of my life, but of our family's life and prayer and meditation. Now, I know some people just go for walks and they hike and that's where they come into the awe that's necessary when we meet creation. For me, it's that too. But I, I read the sacred texts, the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Bible. I believe that all people who are truthful truth seekers will, will get to the same place. Some of the most Christian people I know are not Christians. So I'm wary of piety or pious people. But yes, I really do believe in God, the God of the Bible. And the first door for me to meet my maker is in the morning. And it is the door of gratitude that I'm still there. <laughs> I've woken up. You know, I could not agree with you anymore that gratitude is prayer, right? Gratitude is prayer. You know, I look to divine mind for guidance and direction, but gratitude is a great way to start the day. Bono, I'd like to close this interview with advice you might have for young listeners. What life advice can you give to students and young people who want to make a difference in the world, whether that be in music or any other vocation? For God's sake, don't listen to me, <laughs> would be my advice. There are people to listen to, but they're not noisy rock stars. They're probably contemplative lives, like Richard Rohr is one of my favorite, and he's a Franciscan friar. And you might be interested, Hank, to know that Richard Rohr, he's a book out called The Universal Christ, where he talks about how the environment, the natural world, is likely the first incarnation of Christ. And it's a, it's, it, it sounds almost heretical, but it's a beautiful idea that I think you and Wendy understand naturally that, um, you know, we had to learn that to see the divinity in the people we were stepping over as we walked into our workplaces um, the homeless on the street. We had to learn to find divinity in the people who disagreed with us. In fact, to find divinity in the people who opposed us and who loathed us, you know, you're our enemies. We have to find divinity in our enemies. But the, the calling for this present moment in time for this planet is to see the divinity in the natural world as well as each other. So you are on that path and it's a steep one right now. But I know, I know that's a path you're committed to. And I'm really, really humbled to be walking way down the hill behind you. But I'm keeping an eye out for your balding bonce. Your shaved head, sir. I'll see it in the distance as a beacon. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bono, this has been terrific. 
We've covered a lot of ground, given our listeners a lot to think about and some real inspiration along the way. So thanks. Well, thank you. I hope they have one of those little, you know, fast forward bits uh, for when I go on. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.